episode 27. Let's do this. This is the business of architecture. Helping architects conquer the world. And here's your host, Enoch Sears. Welcome back, Architectos. This is Enoch, and Business of Architecture is the show where we talk about making more money as an architect so you can forget about paying the bills and focus on doing what you love. Today, we are diving into the world of design build. Is it true that contractors make all the money? If you've ever thought about building your projects as well as designing them, You'll want to listen to this episode twice. Hello and welcome Agile Architects. This is Enoch from Business of Architecture. And today we're joined by David Doucette. David has been practicing architecture for 22 years and is a co-founder of architectexamprep.com, which provides encouragement and inspiration for architectural candidates on the road to licensure. He's also founder of cscprep.com, which helps candidates become licensed architect in California. And a funny side note, I actually went through one of David's courses to help me pass my California architect's exam. So David, thanks for that. You're welcome. And I wanted to add that David is also a licensed architect in California, New York, and Nevada. He's a licensed general contractor and a licensed real estate broker. Any other licenses you have there, David, that we need to know about? Uh, private pilot's license and my motorcycle license. That is awesome. <laughs> so. I want to get more into what makes you tick here. So his company, Reside Architecture, has provided design build services for three years, culminating in achieving lead silver for an extensive existing remodel in Hollywood, California. And that is what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about, David, we're going to talk about your experience running a design build company. So a big hearty welcome to the show. Thank you, Enoch. Thank you for having me. And I couldn't have I couldn't have said the introduction better if I said it myself. Why, thank you. Coming from an experienced <laughs> podcaster, I, I take that uh, very seriously. <laughs> David, you, you mentioned that you, you know, you had a design build company and that was a, it was about a three year period. And it was hairy and scary and fun and exciting and challenging and all the above. So take us up to the point of, you know, you graduated from school and then what got you into the design build? And then let's dig in a little bit deeper into actually running a design build firm. So tell me how you got to that point. Sure. The, uh, the construction end of things, I've, uh, I've always enjoyed uh, the construction. And I remember being back in Boston when I was working uh, for an architect and going to the Boston Architectural Center, which is now called College. Uh, we were, we did a lot of tenant improvements and uh, just going to the job site and seeing like raw metal studs. I was like, wow, this is what this stuff actually looks like and seeing the raw space. So I've always just loved that uh, aspect of it. So then in, in the 90s, I worked a lot in Boston, did a lot of project management stuff on TI kind of stuff. Uh, moved out to L.A. in 2000 after being in Boston for eight years in New York. And then uh, came out here and then really started working in residential. I started working for residential architect and realized how different residential is from commercial. It's a completely different uh, skill set. And I really enjoyed the residential. I was like, wow, this is really great. It kind of reinvigorated uh, my passion of architecture again. So then, of course, I did that for a few years. And then in 2002, opened my own office. Uh, finally got my California's license, California Architects license in uh, 2007. And uh, already, I think I had gotten my contractor's license just before that. The idea being that now I'm going to have my architect's license, I have to get my general contractor's license so I can just do design build rather than, you know, from period of 2002 to 2006, having great projects, second story additions, and always referring them to different contractors, I felt like, well, I can do it better than they can do it. So why don't I just get my contractor's license and, and add that to it? And, and part of it was to, yeah, I can make more money, but also I can have a better product and I can give the, the clients a better experience. Yeah, okay. Well, tell me how you went from working. You were, first of all, working for another architect. Tell me how you the jump off, what happened that allowed you to go into practice for yourself? That's a good question. You know, I said from probably when 
I don't know, when I was like 15 or 16, I'm going to own my own firm by the time I'm 32. And, uh, you know, I don't have any great stories of, I guess, inspiration when I was little wanting to be an architect. I just really liked how buildings went together. Uh, and I did figure out, you know, probably when I was uh, soft, sophomore, 10th grade in high school that, you know, architect, I think that's what I want to do. Um, so I kind of moved ahead doing that. So around 2002, when I went on my own, uh, coincidentally enough, I was uh, 31. Uh, so it was fitting into my goal that I created, you know, 15 years ago. Uh, but that wasn't necessarily the reason, just the timing was right. Uh, and it just felt like, okay, now it's time to go on my own, which I did. And I had a couple of clients to, to do that with. Awesome. And then how, how long were you on your own until you started getting into the design build area? I was on my own for... Uh, probably about five years. And, and actually, the first thing I'll, I'll say about, uh, I guess, unrelated to design build, but anybody who's thinking about even starting their own firm is uh, it's all about controlling your expenses. You might think it's about the generating income, which it's part of it. But the bigger part is controlling your expenses, because as we're going to talk about with this design build stuff, uh, it doesn't matter if you have a, a bunch of money coming in, but you're paying a bunch of it out. At the end of the day, what are you really making? So really, I think the, the biggest thing in all of this is controlling your expenses. Even when I uh, opened my own office the first time at 2002, the office was too big. I thought I could grow into it, which I sort of eventually did, but it was still a big nut uh, at the beginning. Okay, and I was going to do a follow-up question. What are the, those expenses in the early days that you would have rather pared down? You know, what I would have done is I wouldn't have rented uh, an office so quickly. You know, I was thinking, I'm opening my own office. Um, I, you know, I gotta, I, I'm opening my own firm. I got to have an office. And uh, at the time, I was with my then um, fiance. We were in a one-bedroom condo. So working from home wasn't an option. But what I did is I rented a 600-square-foot office. I could have rented a smaller office. Or nowadays, you know, people are working at Starbucks. People are doing, like, co-loft kind of things where they can just, you know, pay a few hundred bucks a month to have dedicated space certain hours of the day. So I would definitely rec recommend that. Uh, make sure you have definitely a, a solid base of clients and, and, and uh, better cash flow before you really get that expense of the office. And also... When I got the office, one phone line wasn't enough. I have to have three because what happens if, you know, somebody else is calling while somebody else is on the phone? And keep in mind, it was just me. I wasn't opening this with employees. And then I needed a dedicated fax line. And, you know, so that adds a couple hundred bucks. So out the door, I was probably in it for a grand um, without solid money coming. In. It was it, looking back. It was silly. Mm. Gotcha. So ramp up the income before you start to ramp up the expenses. Absolutely. Excellent. Yeah. So tell me about those first few clients, because that's always something architects want to know. They want to go out on their own. You know, where did they, where did you pick up your first couple clients? Were they pre-existing relationships? Uh, they were pre-existing relationships. And uh, this one I will uh, I talk about was, um, if anybody knows of the counter, uh, the 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 burger joint, the modern burger joint. There there's some in California. I think they're starting to franchise around the country. But a quick story on that is, I did that project as uh, sort of a favor to a contractor's brother-in-law and the whole nine yards. Um, but I basically designed it, and uh, because I wasn't licensed and I didn't have a good contract uh, at the time. I, you know, I got paid a very small fee to do the restaurant, but then the, my client, the owner went and franchised, uh, the restaurant, essentially my design without me being compensated. And that was my first sort of learning thing, you know, and I had talked to attorneys, uh, about it and, um, they said, you're de you could definitely argue you're entitled to something but you could spend $50,000 and not get anything. So do you want to take that risk? So it was kind of like, well, A, I don't have that money, and I'm just trying to build this business. So, But it took a few years to get over that one. 
Wow. So the so that one was a friends and family gig. It was a friends gig, and uh, and because you know it's a friends gig, oh, I don't really need a solid contract, which by the way you do. But again, you're thinking, and especially when you're just starting out, you're really excited. You know, you're just thankful for the work, and you just want to say yes, 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 I'll do whatever. Um, but that that can come back to uh, to bite you. So yeah, take it take it seriously from the beginning. Okay. And would you say one project is enough? One project like that is enough to launch a f- new firm? No, it's not. What I would do and what I would encourage other architects who are thinking about this, I don't think you should do anything that would be in violation of your firm's policy. But I know there's a lot of architects who do commercial work and then they'll sort of moonlight doing residential work. Um, what I would recommend is moonlight, as long as it's okay with your firm, you know, moonlight uh, kind of as long as you can because it's nice having that steady paycheck while you're you're building your business. And I'll tell you, for the first few years, I did a ton of uh, small projects, uh, bathroom renovations, uh, small master suite uh, additions. They're very time consuming, uh, especially to do it well. And um, they they don't bring in a whole lot of money and you think, well, if I do a bunch of small projects, then that money adds up, which it can, but a bunch of small projects equals a whole bunch of time, which would be yeah. difficult to do moonlighting. I mean, you, I would imagine moonlighting you can handle a couple of projects, but once I'd say once you get three or four sort of uh, solid projects, uh, something like a second story addition that might be four hundred thousand dollars or something like that, then you can start thinking, okay, am I ready to to make the leap? Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm sure the people listening right now, there's probably some strong feelings about moonlighting either one way or the other. You know, the older, more established architects that are listening that have firms, they might be one side of the fence. The younger up and comings are on the other side in terms of wanting to do moonlighting. So I guess that's a whole nother conversation, maybe an interesting one, though. I mean, that's definitely something I've never really touched on here on the podcast. That is a that is a good topic, actually. Yeah, yeah. So, David, you're as a businessman, you're looking at your firm and you're saying, I'm leaving money on the table. And I've thought this myself, you know, let's 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 make more money from our current clients. Yeah. Right. So tell me, let's dive into the design build. Tell me how that thought process went. Tell me about your first project and and let's get into the details. Yeah. The uh, and I I think design build is a a fascinating way to go about the process. I think uh, it's still. Uh, a very viable business model. Uh, for example, Marmel Radziner, they do it very well. Um, but what they do, and what I didn't realize, it, you know, at the time, the way I did my business, but they, they're both architects. One focuses on design, the other uh, focuses on the construction aspect, and, and that's how they've uh, divvied the, the, uh, the workflow up. What I did was I was thinking, well, I got the residential stuff down, uh, you know, the design stuff down. So let me just add the contracting and you know what? I'll wear both hats. I can do this. Um, so that's what I did. And I, um, and you know, I sort of, uh, semi looked around for uh, a partner along these lines when I was doing this, but, but nothing serious. What did you try to do to find a partner? It's just people I would meet, you know, there was this one girl, I can't remember her name. She was more of, uh, I can't think of who she was. She's more of a designer. And I was thinking, hey, you could be the designer. And then I, you know, I would be the construction end of it. And she kind of, you know, she thought about it, but it wasn't really, uh, really her thing. Um, And the, the problem with wearing both hats is it doesn't give you uh, a moment to breathe. Because what I realize is every decision on the job comes from you. Whether it's a design decision or a construction decision, it comes from you. And that is uh, a lot of responsibility. It's a lot of stress. Um, And I think most of the stress in this design build process comes from the actual construction. Because once things are in motion, there's people relying on you. There's your employees, there's your client, there's your subcontractors, you have schedules. Uh, It's it's crazy. Uh, it, it's it's really stressful. So to try and wear both hats, um, I don't recommend it. Okay. So I know we look at the from the architect's side. We look at it and we say, man, those those contractors are getting all the money. 
I mean, you look at their fees compared to our fees. You even look at the way that they have the client's ear during the build phase, and it just seems so tantalizing. So is this a, is this a fact or fiction, David, that the contractors are the ones making all the money? You know, that actually is a great question. Um, I think it's a little bit of both, and here's why. The way here in L.A. it sort of uh, breaks down is the, the fee for an architect is – somewhere around 10 to 15 percent the cost of construction. Now a general contractor is typically going to get um, 20 percent the cost of construction or I should say the general contractor is going to take all of their items of the subs add everything up and then they're going to add 20 percent onto that. So that 20 percent is their overhead and profit uh, and that is the cost of construction which then our fee is based upon. Um, but I will tell you in terms of the fact or fiction, contractors, the good contractors, I think, earn every penny they make. Um, and the contracting business, as we know from being architects, can have its shady side. Uh, and I think it does. Um, and I've, I've seen it from sort of other contractor friends explaining to me how they uh, kind of set up their business in this sort of weird way. Uh, and, and one thing I'll mention here with my struggles with uh, all of this I always did everything on the books, and I do my own books. I use QuickBooks, and I've just learned over the years how to use it, but I've always done everything on the books, um, workers' comp, liability insurance, all that stuff. And when you're doing stuff as a contractor, you're doing everything on the books, it's expensive to have a business. Um, and I know the, the better contractors in L.A., they probably charge more than 20%. You know, they're doing – you know, one to two to five million dollar homes, they're not probably not doing these $250,000 renovations um, because you have to, you have to realistically got to charge probably more than 20% to actually make the, the business work, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does make sense. And I'm just curious why or what costs go into that 20%, you know, help me break it down. Yeah, let's um, you know, let's take a look at this uh, this West Hollywood job that I did, um, which was uh, a project I did. Um, we probably finished in two thousand nine. It was a two story renovation. The house was about three thousand square feet, maybe. We didn't add any square footage to the house, but we completely gutted it. And um, the construction cost, and by the way, it was um, achieve lead silver. Uh, and I think at the time it was it was one of the first homes to uh, to get the lead rating for an existing house. Uh, the and I was the architect and contractor on it, so my fee was ten percent for the architect design fee, and then the contractor was twenty percent. So you might think, well, since I'm I'm doing both, can I give a discount? And I did not, and I don't recommend that because. Yes, you're getting both sides of the work, but as we were just talking about, like that 10% really goes to running the architecture side of the business. And that 20% really goes to running the contracting side of the business. And they're really two separate businesses. So if you're giving a discount, uh, you know, for let's say, for example, I'll do it for 25% total instead of 30%, you've just eaten into your profit on either the architecture side or the contractor side. That's not sustainable. Um, so I think our construction, the, the contractors, the cost of construction, let's say it was around 550,000 or 580,000 or somewhere around there. Again, we didn't add any square footage, uh, but I think we still ended up about $250 a square foot. So we did some really nice stuff there. So, um, so that cost of construction, 550 or thereabouts, that included, the 20% you know, overhead and profit for the contractor side. So then my architecture fee um, was 10% of that. So the architecture fee was probably, uh, yeah, maybe 50,000 or thereabouts. Now, so 20%, so the contractor fee, let's say, I'm thinking roughly here, but it was probably 100,000. The to Let's say the total, total fee 30% of this whole thing was, say, 150000 Like, that was my fee. And that sounds like a lot of money, and it is. But let's break it down. Let's say the general contractor fee was hundred grand. 
you know, the architecture fee was 50,000. So out of that 100 grand for the general contracting fee, probably half is legitimate costs of running the business. So that leaves about maybe 50,000 in profit. And the architecture fee, um, which I think we said was about 50, you know, say uh, a third of that is the cost of running the business. So, you know, you're looking at about maybe um, 75, $80,000 in profit, maybe from this job, like pure profit. Uh, and I'm kind of, you know, guessing here, but now let's break it down. We were probably a year and a half in design and we were uh, almost a year in construction. So it's a two, two and a half year project. So now when you break out that, what sounds to be great $75,000 profit, you start breaking down, it's not a whole lot. Um, and, and my, my, I didn't manage the whole, uh, the whole thing, uh, correctly, but that's getting off topic to our, our, uh, our, our cost uh, of construction. So, so the cost here, um, as you're saying, it sounds great, this money we're leaving on the table, but when you step back and you look at it, there's not a lot of money, uh, that we are leaving on the table. Certainly, there's more money we can make, but it's going to require uh, a whole bunch more time than what we're putting into the architecture side of things. Okay. So what are some of the costs that go into the running of a contracting business? You know, the um, there's the general liability, um, which that was probably uh, it's probably somewhere around five grand, let's say. Uh, workers' comp, I can't remember exactly what I was paying uh, a month for workers' comp, but it was probably, uh, you know, I can't even remember a number. It could have been around $1,000 or more um, because the way workers' comp works is when we're an architect, we have workers' comp for employees in the office. Their rate is very low because the risk of injury is very low. But when you're in the field, uh, especially foundation, when you're digging foundations, rebar, saws, carpenters, roofers are, are probably the, the most expensive because the dangers in, in working on a roof. So you need your, your workers' comp, you, the hours that you're paying that position, that's what your workers' comp is based on. And it's not cheap. It's, uh, and again, I did everything on the books. I didn't try and you know uh, hide hours or any of that stuff. Um, so there's that, and then there's the equipment. And because I had this uh, false sense of making a lot of money, and I was building this business up, I mean, I, was, I bought saws, I bought uh, a rotary drill, I bought a cement mixer, uh, and then, of course, I had to get a, a storage space, which is just down the hall from me now. Uh, I had to rent that for 600 bucks a month because I got to store all this stuff. You know, so, um, and, and at the time... The, the the cash, you had cash. I mean, I, I had the cash. So it wasn't like I didn't think I couldn't afford it. I had the cash. Here it is. Let's go buy the stuff. Let's build this house. And then later you just looked at the books and it just kind of all disappeared. Is that? Yeah, that's a, that's actually exactly what happened. Uh, there was, there was a, a couple of uh, things that I think that were happening with me that that made me look at that the that made me step back and look at you know I can't continue down uh, this road. Um, one of them, one of them was the the profit. Uh, once I stepped back after doing this for three years, I did four or five projects. Uh, one actually was a was an investment that we did for ourselves and flipped, um, and that one we actually did make money on. But uh, once I stepped back and I kind of balanced the books, um, I was like. Wow, for this three years, uh, I didn't make much money. Uh, I could have made more working for an architect for eighty grand a year and not having to worry about any of the stress. I could have made more money doing that than what I just did for design build uh, the past three years, and that that was a big uh, eye opener. But the other thing I want to uh, mention here is is the cost uh, of our time and. You know, I mean, I think as architects, we're trained to put in long hours. It's just it's what we do. It's what we did in architecture school. It's like they condition us in architecture school to put in long hours. So then we get our first job and we put in long hours and we just we continue to do that. 
Uh, and, and that's what I did with design build. I was working 60 to 70 hours a week and I loved it. I mean, I thought, I thought this is great. Like I'm design building, I'm doing this lead house in West Hollywood. I mean, how cool is that? You know, like I'm, like I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do. That is cool. It is. I mean, it was cool. It was definitely, uh, cool. Like I was the guy, you know, um, and I was the guy who had all the answers and, I was the guy who people would come to with questions and I would, I would have the answers for them and they would go do it, you know? So it was empowering. I mean, it was, it was, uh, it was cool. I enjoyed it. Um, it was stressful, but it's that kind of stress for me that you're like, this, this, this is what gets me up in the morning. Like this is motivating, you know? So I think I lost part of your question there. Sorry no, about no, that. You totally nailed it. And I just wanted one last detail I wanted to ask. Were you paying yourself a salary out of that? You know, if you take away the cost of running the business, was a salary for you included in there? You know, that's the thing. No, I wasn't taking a, oh. a consistent salary. No, it was it was crazy. Um, I was not taking a consistent salary. Um, and and that that was uh, part of the issue. I mean, we did have some savings, actually, that that we were dipping into our savings account. Uh, and again, we're thinking at the time when you're in this, you're like, I'm doing this great project. This is going to lead to more work. So yeah, let's take a little bit of our, our savings now. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll just keep the money back in the business. We'll pour it into the business. We'll, we'll buy some new equipment. You know, we'll buy this cool new thing. And so you're in it and you're just motivated and you, and you feel sort of unstoppable. Yeah, absolutely. You know, that's funny. And it totally sheds a new light on it to know that you weren't taken a salary because now we look at that 80 grand or whatever it was I guess 80 grand and we say okay no that's your salary that's not even your profit it's almost like that's your salary yeah exactly you know? and and I really wasn't even taking it I'll, I'll give you a really good uh, example of of um, you know the stakes are higher when we're when we're a contractor um, this project was supposed to last for uh, eight months and I had a um, uh, I did what I did is I hired a lead carpenter and a lead carpenter there's books written about lead carpenters but they're essentially a combination of sort of a working car uh, working carpenter and a, a job site supervisor or project manager they're basically wearing both hats so the uh, the concept is great and basically you can have somebody running your job site you know doing the carpentry work while they're there and also coordinating subs and and you know all that kind of stuff uh, that that normally you'd hire a project manager for, and then I was thinking, well, I do that, then I can you know run the architecture side of the office, and I was paying this guy I think about thirty five bucks an hour to do this. Now in my um, in my breakdown, I built his his cost. I built it into you know the breakdown that I gave the client. So whatever thirty five bucks an hour is. Uh, for I think seven months, I guess. Let's say it was thirty-five thousand dollars. Like that was in there. So his salary was in there. He was taken care of. I'm like, this is genius. What happens is the project's not done in seven months. And this guy wasn't doing what he was supposed to do. I ended up having to coordinate all the subs. So now I'm spending more time making many trips from Santa Monica into West Hollywood on a Friday afternoon. Um, and basically all he ended up doing was being an expensive carpenter. Uh, he was good at what he did, but he, he could only kind of do the task that was in front of him. So then to alleviate this, I had uh, an employee, uh, working in the office here, the architect side of things. I think he was getting 30 bucks an hour. I said, all right, why don't you go out there? Steve can't handle this. So I'm going to put you out there for the next couple of weeks to handle it. So now I have him out there for 30 bucks an hour. He's not built into the project trying to run this job and that actually didn't work cut to seven months goes by the the salary for Steve is is been taken care of but now it's done there's no more the project went on for another three months and he was still on the project now I could have fired him and brought someone else in I wasn't in a position to do that because uh, he was good at what he did but I was paying him $35 an hour for three months, that was coming out of that $80,000 profit. You know, that that yeah. ate into that. That was coming right out of my pocket. Uh, and it hurt. I mean, it really hurt. And, and part of why I was saying earlier, don't wear both hats because you get so 
uh, consumed by it that you, you're making decisions. You're not able to step back and take a holistic view because you're thinking like, I got to keep this project moving. You know, I can't find another Steve. These guys are hard to find to begin with. Um, Steve is doing what he's supposed to do in terms of just building the stuff. So it, it was it was challenging. So again, if you're doing this with another either partner with another architect or another contractor where you're wearing one hat and then somebody else is wearing the other hat, then then, you know, it makes sense. But you're also now splitting half of the profit. OK, yeah. So I can see you basically paid him an extra seventeen or eighteen thousand dollars there. Yeah. And then all that money sort of disappeared. So how many people were actually on your payroll? You talk, sort of talked about um, about the, the workers' comp. How many people were actually on your payroll versus this actual subs? Yeah, that's a good question too. So I, I had um, probably about anywhere from three to six people on my payroll for that job. And generally what I did, because there's, there's what they call paper contractors. And paper contractors are contractors who don't have any employees and they just sub everything out and they just manage the subs. It's it's pretty common here. Uh, typically on smaller projects, I'd say maybe less than $500,000. Not uncommon. Then there's the other ty type of contractor who's basically like your mom and pop's contractor who's an older guy who just does everything, uh, but he usually only works on one or two projects at a time. Uh, the way I set it up, is I wanted to have hired as an employee, I wanted to hire the carpenters uh, as my employees. So basically we did the carpentry, we did the foundation, we did the rebar, uh, all the rough framing uh, and, and finish, uh, finish framing as well. So those were all my employees. So I was paying them hourly to do that. And then we subbed everything else out. And part of the reason is, is I wanted more control over my employees for the framing and the foundation part, because I easily could have subbed that out. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's debatable on, on do you save money if you actually just sub it out and then you don't have to worry about it versus um, your employees doing it. I don't think there's a big, you know, cost savings either way. Although if you're efficient at this and you've got a lot of workflow, then it definitely makes sense to hire these guys as your employees. But with that comes the responsibility is, okay, you got to have work for them after this next job. You know, with a, with a subcontractor, obviously, you don't have that, uh, that responsibility because they're not employees. Awesome. Awesome. Well, David, I think that's a good place to, to break the first part of this interview. Okay. So, you know, we covered a lot about the, that initial project. And next week, I want to jump into a little bit more of, you know, what happened with the design build firm and then how you wound it down and the reasons for doing that. Okay, sounds good. Sounds good. All right, David, thanks for being on the show. All right, we'll see you, Nick. Yep, bye-bye. Bye. And that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. To get more resources about how you as an architect can raise your fees, land the projects you love to work on, and get the time in your day back, join the members-only Business of Architecture Insider list for free by going to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash free. Enter your best email address there and I will send you instant access to free resources including my book, Social Media for Architects. If you'd like to discuss a thought or insight from today's show, visit businessofarchitecture.com slash podcast. On that page, you'll also find my notes from today's show and the action items I took away from our conversation. Until next week, keep rocking and go conquer the world. views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help architects conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, do it anyway. <laughs>